Mm-hmm. Or if you have... For like the fusion capacitances? Like you, you talked about in the class, but... Right, uh, most... Most likely you do have to... Yeah, no wire capacitance. All right, good morning and welcome to week four of E141. So we are rolling forward. Uh, we have another homework assignment this week. Uh, last week we hopefully figured out the enrollments increasing the class size to 86. So I think everybody should be uh, fine at the moment. Uh, lab 3 is on schedule uh, this week. And um, make sure that you check out your homeworks early so you have enough time to uh, take advantage of discussion sessions, office hours, and so on to ask questions. Uh, every any questions about homework, labs, what we've been doing so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a very good question. Question is, uh, which mode of operation should we assume for transistors when we calculate propagation delay, high to low, low to high, because uh, as uh, waveforms uh, go from zero to VDD and vice versa, then transistors go through a range of operation regions. And then uh, we'll talk about that uh, more in today's lecture. You will see uh, simple methods to analyze uh, propagation delay and all you care for is basically just to understand uh, mode of operation between uh, starting point and VDD over 2, which is the 50% uh, crossover point. And then you will see that you can pretty much identify one or two operation regions, mostly one, and uh, be able to make good approximations that will lead you to uh, correct uh, analysis. Another question, yes? Maybe this will also be addressed in lecture. But, um, Yesterday, uh, in discussion, um, Kevin went over something, and then he posted on the news group later that there was some error with the 0.69 RC uh, equation that he went over. I was just wondering if, uh, yeah, if you could clarify that. I don't know if you saw that posting, but uh, like, can, are we allowed to use that equation, the 0.69 RC, for the for problem number one? Uh, for problem number one, the uh, question is, are we going to allow to use 0.69 RC equation for problem number one of homework three, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, you are. So you just m make sure that you are carefully uh, analyze your circuit and identify uh, your equivalent output capacitance and also your equivalent resistance. And the additional uh, complication to that problem is that you have that side load uh, resistor. And then you need to make sure uh, first uh, identify modes of operation for low to high and high to low and then figure out what are the resistances, equivalent resistances from transistors that are in parallel with that uh, uh, shunt resistor at the output. So um, on the same question, on the book we evaluate resistances at VDD and VDD over 2, but as we found out in the problem, the VOH is not VDD and it's pretty far from VDD, and the VOL is also not zero. So when we evaluate the, like, the high to low equ uh, resistance equivalents, um, should we be using VOH instead of VDD? And instead of VDD over 2, we use v VOH plus VOL over 2? because that seems to make more sense. That's a uh, very good point. For uh, correct analysis, you should really use uh, your VOH and VOL and the VM, the switching threshold that you compute uh, for that problem, and then average resistances over, over that range. But for, uh, if, you, uh, if that seems too complicated, you can uh, then uh, assume 
uh, zero in VDD and 50%, and then you will get some partial credit. Mm -hmm. uh, in the second problem, where it asks us to find uh, the various minimum source drain diffusion areas and uh, the perimeter, then it asks, uh, please, li to list the design rules that guide us. Means uh, because NMOS in Cadence Virtuoso environment, we can only see the NMOS as a single block. Uh, how do we really know the design rules that guided uh, that source drain perimeter or the diffusion area? We see it as a one block, we can measure it, but uh, how do we know the design rules that guided that formation? Uh, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, how do you know which design rules were applied to get uh, uh, the NMOS of a certain uh, size and then uh, you you can take two approaches one is you can uh, draw polygons and uh, create transistor yourself to really see the impact of overlapping diffusion with poly and uh, see where you really go uh, push up to the limits and break the design rules and see what's the uh, minimum uh, size that you can end up with uh, or you can simply uh, abstract that all away and say, well, I'm going to use the MOS transistor that's given to me because I'm really not uh, now in the mood to do all this layout exercise and then uh, figure out for that minimum size transistor, then you do exactly what you said, measure basically and say, this is what basically came out from design rules because that's the minimum transistor I can, I can put down and you can work with that, sure. Mm -hmm. Another question. <laughs> And uh, in our, uh, prob our problem one and D, uh, in this uh, qu uh, question we are supposed to find a static power dissipation. And in this problem, are we supposed to assume the load resistance 100k ohm is attached or not? It is attached, correct, yes. For power consumption uh, calculation, loads attached. And also I found that in the problem two, uh, um, in the final question E, uh, I'm, I, I used the uh, short channel model but like the problem is the this spice model is n is not including the short channel effect short channel model is this just like a, it doesn't um have goes into uh go into the velocity saturation it's operating in a normal saturation mode so the the spice result and uh, my calculation result doesn't match that's fine as, as far as you explain what you were doing then that that's okay you get full credit Okay. Okay. Uh, so rolling forward, uh, we've uh, been dealing with uh, uh, design cost metrics, and we looked into uh, reliability and cost metrics. And now uh, we are moving moving forward uh, and uh, finishing wrapping up with uh, speed and perform and uh, power. Uh, metrics. So last time we uh, introduced MOS capacitances that uh, were quite useful uh, to understand in uh, analysis of uh, power uh, and uh, also speed of uh, gates. And today we are going to wrap up uh, MOS capacitances, refresh what we discussed last time, and then we'll go on to a switching model of transistor to define propagation delay. Uh, of a gate and then uh, we will uh, see what components of power do we need to worry about and then later on we will be coming back to these concepts uh, when uh, we construct uh, complex gates and more complicated structures and see how we can use all these parameters that we uh, defined in lectures. So let's uh, first review MOS capacitances uh, and dynamic behavior. So this is basically a capacitive device model. Uh, that we introduced last time. So we have four electrodes of MOSFET and uh, there is a mutual capacitance between each electrode pair except uh, source and drain that form conductive channel. And then uh, we went uh, into discussion and identified a couple really important contributors uh, to these capacitances. So we said uh, most importantly it's important to understand uh, the gate uh, to channel capacitance and it was uh, split up into three components, uh, gate to source, gate to drain, and uh, gate to bulk. And then in addition to that, we also had these uh, diffusion overlap uh, capacitances that come from the overlap of uh, polysilicon gate and underneath diffusion on both source and drain sides. And uh, then we also identified these diffusion capacitances uh, that are uh, connected between source and drain and uh, bulk terminal. And then finally, we talked about this Miller capacitance. 
So basically, uh, we have CGD, that's uh, the capacitance that is floating between gate and drain terminals. And the bias conditions on that capacitance changed, and then we uh, introduced the concept of Miller effect to model uh, that uh, capacitance uh, uh, appropriately. All other capacitances were uh, connected to uh, steady state voltage on either source or body terminal. Okay? Uh, question? Uh, for the first problem, actually, I don't think this is a good question, but for the first problem, do you millerize the CGS uh, capacitance on the top transistor? CGS, you don't. So basically, if you look at this model, the only capacitance you can ever possibly millerize is CGD because it's between two floating nodes. Right, but in, in, the, in that uh, problem, it's connected from VD to the output. Oh, f uh, okay, so for th you're talking about the problem number one, when you have yeah. basically two NMOS transistors. Okay, so, uh, yeah. uh, um, so for that problem, you basically have a uh, source follower, right? So you have uh, uh, your gate and source voltages. You have a ba basic unity gain configuration. You just have a shifter. So then you think if you need to do Miller in that case. Uh -huh. Why do we need to include Miller? Because the gate is at VDD, so it's like ground. So we can say it's between the, the output and ground. So why do we have to include Miller effect? No, I'm just uh, telling you, think if you need to include Miller oh, effect, well, probably. <laughs> so you're thinking right. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> OK. So now uh, we also went into discussion, where do these compa components arise from? And then um, let's briefly review uh, these various uh, capacitances that contribute into that uh, MOS uh, capacitive model. So let's first analyze the gate channel uh, capacitance. It's a very important to understand that's one of the big capacitances. It's really uh, the one that you should be looking at uh, first before uh, analyzing others. So we said that the gate uh, to channel capacitance uh, can be distributed over uh, gate to source, gate to drain, and gate to bulk. And then depending the, on the operation regime of your device, uh, cutoff, triode, or saturation, uh, these various components will take uh, different values. So we first said if a device is cut off, then no channel is formed. So we basically have all the capacitance between gate and bulk. And then we had uh, Cox WL effective. So that's purely uh, coming from your uh, oxide uh, over here between the gate and the channel. And then uh, as soon as the device turns on, then basically you form a conductive channel and basically your bulk electrode is shielded. So you have zeros over here. And also, um, when uh, your device is in the triode region, so then your bulk is shielded, and then you equally distribute your gate to channel capacitance between source and drain terminals. And then you have CoxWL effective over two in both source and drain. And then finally, uh, in saturation mode, you have a channel pinched off at the drain side, and therefore no capacitance over there. And also, bulk has been shielded uh, a long time ago, so there is no uh, con uh, capacitance between gate and bulk. But uh, you observe somewhat reduced capacitance between gate and source, and this is due widening of this uh, depletion region over here. So you have factor two thirds. And then what we said that the most important regions uh, to understand are cutoff and saturation. So when you look at your uh, device from the input side, look at your gate, then the gate channel capacitance is simply equal Cox WL in cutoff or two thirds Cox uh, WL in saturation. And this is important uh, to remember from this slide when you do calculations like uh, you do in uh, your homework. It may take you a while to uh, get familiar with this, but uh, basically just uh, uh, go a couple times over uh, this material, think of uh, the contribution, and kind of sort it out. Uh, become familiar with uh, what's uh, going on over here. And uh, this oxide capacitance is purely given by epsilon ox divided by T ox. That's the unit capacitance, uh, unit area capacitance uh, for your transistor. 
So now uh, the other component related to gate is this uh, gate overlap capacitance. So basically due to uh, diffusion uh, underneath uh, the gate on both source and drain uh, sides, we have uh, this overlap uh, that is basically, you can almost say this is uh, dependent on technology and it's almost uh, a constant. So basically the uh, Area unit area capacitance in this case uh, is also C ox, and we normally multiply by this uh, factor x d to get uh, the unit width capacitance because you can assume that uh, for a given technology this x d is approximately constant, and in this case you're normally provided with this uh, unit width uh, parameter, and then simply in all operation regions cutoff linear. Uh, and saturation, you have that your uh, gate to source and gate to drain overlap capacitance is equal to this parameter CO times W. And then finally we have these diffusion capacitances that are related to uh, bulk and uh, source and drain uh, diffusion uh, uh, capacitance. Uh, so you basically have depletion region of the reverse biased junction. So we had, for example, uh, source in this case, but it applies uh, to drain uh, as well. So source and substrate will form a junction between uh, this ND and NA uh, areas. And as a result, you will have some um, a depletion region in between that form a capacitor, two plates of uh, the form, uh, two ends of a capacitor. So this plate over here, so diffusion capacitance uh, has this bottom uh, component that's uh, proportional to the area of uh, this entire uh, diffusion. And uh, it is uh, proportional to this constant unit area times uh, the area of your source or drain. And then also you have this uh, perimeter capacitance, the sidewall capacitance, all the way around the perimeter except under the channel because uh, this uh, uh, capacitance was related uh, to this channel stop implant uh, and uh, this was a highly doped uh, uh, N plus, NA plus uh, implant so its capacitance was higher than uh, this uh, junction capacitance. And then uh, we normalize also this uh, unit area capacitance with the depth of this diff diffusion which we also uh, assume that uh, we can approximate with a constant. So this xj times the unit area is equal to this sidewall capacitance per unit uh, uh, length. So we go around the perimeter and multiply by this factor. So in all modes of operation over here uh, you have basically the presence of this diffusion capacitance. Okay. So now uh, this is a summary of all the components and operation regimes uh, that you apply uh, the expressions for. So we have gate to channel capacitance uh, in the uh, cutoff or triode. You have simply the oxide capacitance, pure geometry over here. So you have C ox W L effective. And uh, then in the saturation, you have this factor of uh, 2 over 3. Then for the gate overlap capacitance, in all modes of operation you have this uh, overlap uh, capacitance per unit width uh, multiplied by this W. And then finally, contribution of junction in diffusion capacitances is, is given in this expression that you have junction capacitance per unit area uh, times uh, the area of uh, the diffusion plus the sidewall capacitance. Now, importantly now I say we know uh, there is lots of these uh, components, but the, the question now is which components dominate, which are useful, because as a designer that's what you would like to know to be able to make uh, good decisions about uh, sizing your device and so on. And then we evaluated uh, these capacitances at zero bias condition first. And then we concluded that uh, the diffusion capacitance was slightly greater than the gate capacitance. And uh, this was really uh, unfortunate because uh, this is a purely parasitic uh, effect that you don't want uh, uh, to have. But uh, the good news is that, as we saw in a previous lecture, is that this capacitance is a voltage dependent. And as soon as you increase your uh, drain voltage, then you basically have reverse biasing of your junction. And then your depletion region widens, which equivalently turns out uh, into capacitance reduction. And uh, in normal uh, mode of operation when your device is turned on, diffusion capacitance is usually less, at most equal to the gate capacitance. So that's what you need to remember. Now, we a uh, question, yes. But even in normal operation, 
uh, usually source and bulk are tied together so for that uh, diffusion component of source and bulk zero bias condition will always more or less always be true uh, correct tough luck in that case yes Mm -hmm. Good observation. Okay, so then we went into this model of computing the capacitances, and this is really what you uh, need to understand for, for your homework, and it's a really important takeaway point. So I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, doctor this slide a little bit and uh, emphasize important points uh, over here. So what you have is basically a configuration of uh, your driving gate and your fan out gate. And this is what we're going to do uh, later on in performance uh, and power uh, analysis. And so you have, if you want to actually analyze uh, each individual uh, capacitance, in each individual component, then this can, becomes really kind of uh, complicated. So as a designer, what would you ideally want to do is basically uh, derive a simple model where you have your driving gate loaded with some equivalent capacitance. And then uh, it is of interest to calculate the total equivalent load capacitance at the output of this driving gate to be able to calculate its propagation delay and other properties that we'll talk about later. And then uh, in this schematic, uh, we indicated all uh, the capacitive components that are present uh, in this uh, circuit. And then, so you have basically, you have uh, your drain to bulk for the PMOS, uh, drain to bulk for the NMOS, then you have this gate drain capacitances uh, lumped together into this equivalent capacitance, but they are coming from both M1 and M2. Then you have some uh, wire capacitance uh, that uh, comes from the wiring between the uh, output of the first gate and input to the second gate. Then you have the gate capacitances of your M3 and M4 transistors. And a couple important points here to remember, okay. So first, uh, you have this Miller capacitance. As we said, when you have floating uh, capacitor, in this case between gate and drain regions, you Millerize that, okay. So point number one. Uh, point number uh, two, you have basically reversed biased junction because you have a non-zero uh, voltage over at this node during the transients. So you basically, that will kill some of your uh, uh, diffusion uh, capacitance. And then assuming that we uh, undergo a uh, falling transition at the output, uh, then you can basically assume uh, certain modes of operation of uh, M3 and M4. So basically uh, during uh, falling transition at uh, the output of the first gate, you basically can assume that M4 is cut off and it's going into saturation mode and that M3 uh, is in linear mode. And the reason why you assume this is basically because by the time uh, this voltage travels to uh, between VDD and VDD over 2, then this gate didn't have yet enough time to respond. So it's basically a very slow response. So you can pretty much uh, keep uh, this output voltage at uh, very low VDS and uh, then assume that this device is linear, this device is uh, uh, transitioning between cutoff and uh, saturation. And that will help you determine the right operation regime for calculating CG3 and CG4. And another point over here, which you can argue about, is no Miller effect. And the reason why we assumed uh, no Miller effect is uh, basically related to this previous story. You assume that during the time uh, that you're interested to compute the delay of the first gate, the output of uh, the second gate hasn't really responded yet to a full swing between starting point and the switching uh, threshold, so no Miller effect. Now, uh, if your output is not loaded at all, then you will probably get quicker response, very fast response, fast enough such that this Miller will also become to matter. But for the simplicity of analysis, we assume that you just ignore that. In case you, when you have heavily loaded output, when it's really hard to uh, move that output between starting point and the switching threshold, then the Miller effect can be neglected. So you have to be really careful about that. Make sure you understand basically the environment, operating environment of your gate. Uh, analyzing standalone gate uh, is really dangerous. You can do so only if you assume uh, where all these effects are coming from. If you assume certain input slope, make sure is that a valid input slope? Where is it coming from? And so on. So this is important model uh, to understand. Everybody clear uh, with this uh, slide?
Any questions? A couple of questions, Ryan. Um, I was curious on uh, CGD12. When you do the Miller effect, it splits a uh, capacitor into the uh, input and output. So does that mean that you have like an extra output component to the capacitance and an extra input? Well, I guess you would ignore the input on that side, but in calculating CL, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Uh, in calculating CL, you will basically just take the output uh, Miller capacitance. Input Miller capacitance does exist indeed, but in this case, we will uh, basically do simplistic analysis where you assume step input at the input of the gate just for uh, basically introductory purposes. Later on in this class, we will show how you can account for the slope and basically the input capacitance will also start to matter. Another question in the back? That was it? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, how you compute the capacitance, and this should be helpful for your homework. Uh, so you basically have Miller effect on gate drain overlap capacitance uh, for transistor, uh, for this first effect on the input side. Then you have this reversed bias junction at the output for, with, for what reason you use these K equivalent numbers in uh, reducing that basically just scale down uh, the effect of your diffusion capacitance and then assuming low to high transition at uh, output uh, rather high to low over here high to low uh, then you have uh, to make assumption about operate operating regime of uh, gate capacitances and basically you end up with the expression in linear mode, you have COXWL, and uh, initially in the cutoff, you have w, COXWNL. Uh, now, this transistor will uh, transition over to saturation region eventually, and then you will have two-thirds W, uh, uh, two-thirds time, times this. But uh, then uh, you sort of, you can either, either basically average that to a first or order approximation, or you can just say, well, it's mostly uh, basically this capacitance COXWL. Uh, uh, and then uh, work with that assumption. For uh, CGD and CG4, how come we don't take into account the overlap capacitances? For the CGD? 3 and CG4. Uh, let me see. CGD... CG3 and CG4. Uh, you are absolutely correct. We should. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So overlap capacitances over here, that was the question. OK, so now uh, with understanding of capacitances, uh, we are armed uh, with uh, background to uh, go into propagation delay analysis. And then um, reviewing of what we have learned so far about transistor models, uh, we introduced basically two ways to model a transistor. One way was uh, through equivalent uh, current source model. So you say, okay, now I understand uh, all the operation regimes of my transistor. I'm so happy I'm going to use it as a current source. So it's, uh, that's one idea. And then uh, we extensively utilized this model in uh, DC type of analysis where we calculated uh, noise margins and voltage transfer characteristic. And then we saw uh, even there that, and as you experienced in homeworks, then if you really want to include really precise equations and everything, it's, get, it's getting really complicated. So that gives us an idea to introduce an even simpler model. And for that reason, uh, we uh, went into this delay uh, calculation uh, method using equivalent uh, resistor model. And uh, you're very familiar with uh, calculation of uh, delay in RC type of networks, where you have basically just to play with uh, time constants, RC time constants. And we derived in previous lectures that you can uh, also apply the same model uh, to your inverter and basically just calculate the delay uh, by using this formula. You have 0.69 RC, where R is the equivalent resistance of either your pull down as shown in this case, or your pull-up. And the load capacitance CL is uh, the load capacitance that we just calculated. So basically, you have impact of wire capacitance, fan-out gate, and you have self-loading of the driving gate. And those are the values that you need to determine in order to com compute the propagation delay. So now, uh, using this uh, switching model, so you basically assume that uh, when VGS is less than VT, 
your switch is open. When VGS is greater than VT, your switch is closed. But then that switch closed uh, means a lot. It means the entire I versus VD curve. So basically, it is highly dependent on your bias conditions. But uh, the good news for you are, first, that uh, in analyzing switching behavior, you normally have assumption that your input is fully settled to either VOL or VOH. And in CMOS circuits, except a couple exercises in homeworks, uh, you will basically assume zero or VDD. So that gives you uh, one uh, out of many characteristics uh, for VGS uh, to choose from. So you are settled with that. Now the question is, what is your starting point and end, po end point? So in delay calculation, you will either calculate propagation delay high to low, where your output traverses from VDD to VDD over 2, or low to high when your output travels from 0 to VDD over 2, in which case you will be pulling up. So in this case, uh, we assume that we have basically high to low transition and that your NMOS is pulling down. So VGS is equal to VDD. And you have fairly linear behavior of your transistor in this saturation mode when you travel between VDD to VDD over 2. Now, for correct analysis, it would be really good to average the effect of your resistance, equivalent resistance, over this interval as your voltage goes between VDD and VDD over 2. That uh, can be solved precisely, but the problem here is that, uh, first of all, uh, your resistance is really depending on the operating point, and this expression uh, is nonlinear because your resistance changes uh, over here. <coughs> so uh, you have a high resistance uh, going over here, and then it gets uh, uh, the resistance gets uh, changed, and uh, this nonlinear effect becomes linearized when you enter linear or uh, triad uh, mode of operation. But over here, you are still in nonlinear regime. So that gives you an idea if that nonlinearity is really not significant, uh, and uh, then I can simply just average out the resistance between starting and end point, and I'm done. That's a good approximation. And then uh, averaging that resistance, we basically calculated uh, uh, output voltage, that's VDD, divided by the corresponding current at this operating point, plus uh, another resistance that corresponds to this node over here. So that's the mid. Uh, th that's the average between the midpoint and starting point, initial condition. And then uh, you can plug in uh, now values for your ID set and that's the only complicated expression that you will ever do once before you remember this formula, okay? And then if you uh, solve the integral uh, precisely, introducing some reasonable approximation later on in expansion into series, then you will end up with this uh, formula. 3 quarters VDD over ID sat minus, uh, 1 minus uh, 7 over 9 lambda VDD. If you just basically average the two endpoints, you end up with 5 over 6. Now, the if you're going to use 7 over 9 or 5 over 6, it doesn't really matter. The, qu the answer will be uh, very close and very similar. You get full credit for either of the two. But just understand where it's coming from and use uh, whichever formula you like. Question. Um, on this slide, when you solve for REQ, it seems like you take the integral from VDD to VDD over 2, which would be, would be the high to low, I guess, REQ. W would it be different from low to high, from 0 to VDD over 2? So the question is, uh, if, when, when you solve this integral, uh, would your uh, REQ be different from high to low and low to high? And the answer is absolutely yes, because you have PMOS uh, for, uh, responsible for your uh, high to low, uh, uh, sorry, low to high, and you have NMOS responsible for, for your low to high. And now, uh, uh, that's coming in a minute, you actually gave a, a good introduction. Uh, the sizing of relative ratio of PMOS and NMOS does really matter. That's where you can really balance your uh, resistances, but uh, this uh, form of expression is actually the same. You just need to plug in appropriate ID set, and then as you will see, basically your ID set is proportional to your W over L, and some technology parameters and voltages and so on. So basically, we will analyze uh, that uh, in a moment. Uh, question? Yeah, if you have, if you don't have a CMOS inverter, like the homework, and the VOH doesn't call VDD, do we go from VOH to VM and integrate, or 
do you still go from VOD to video HD? Uh, you would normally like to, uh, the question is, do you go between VOH and VM or VDD and VDD over 2? So basically VDD uh, and VDD over 2 is a legacy stuff for uh, CMOS gates, where you assume that you have voltage levels at 0 and VDD and VM. And that's basically coming from, from there. That's a particular case of uh, VOM, uh, VM uh, equal VDD over 2, VOH is equal VDD, VOL is equal to 0. But in, in reality, you have to really be, uh, work between uh, your uh, starting and midpoint between your VOH and your VM, VOL, and, and so on. So, okay, now uh, let's look at the transient response of the inverter that we uh, analyzed a few slides back. So, you have an inverter, you have some load capacitance, and you have some fan out uh, capacitance uh, over uh, at the other end. And let's assume that we have a very sharp uh, step input, and then uh, uh, this um, black line over here shows. Uh, the response of your circuit. So you basically, when you apply a uh, rising transition at the uh, input, you have uh, this, this should be high to low over here, actually. You have to fix this slide. So this is a high to low, because that means output going uh, from high to low. And then you have low to high over here. But then basically, what you need to do is to calculate um, uh, your equivalent resistance and uh, knowing what's going on with your equivalent capacitance, you can basically just plug in this R equivalent into this formula because you already know CL from the previous exercise and to calculate uh, this propagation delay. Now you can average out these two propagation delays to calculate propagation delay of uh, your circuit. And uh, is it a good idea to average or not? Uh, you will uh, understand that uh, in a second. But now the question I have for you, uh, why does this happen? So when you apply your step input, you suddenly have this uh, overshoot above VDD, and then you steadily settle uh, down with a high to low transition. Any ideas? Exactly. So you remember those gate to drain capacitance between your input and output, those guys that we didn't like because they were number one parasitic and number two they will multiply with Miller effect. And then that's what exactly happens. Basically when you uh, apply step input, uh, then uh, voltage at your capacitance cannot instantaneously change, but the current can. And then basically you have uh, that effect propagated to the output even before your uh, output had the time to respond. And then basically when uh, you give it enough time, then you will have uh, your transition settling down. And then what this gives you is basically it hurts your propagation delay. That's one of the reasons why you will have discrepancy when you calculate your propagation delay by hand and then verify in SPICE. So now, uh, it's a uh, question. Yes. Does the Miller effect only f um, account for this spike, and that's all? Uh, it's not actually. Uh, th does the Miller effect account only for this spike, and that's all? Uh, no. Basically, you have a physical capacitance that's sitting between uh, your uh, f uh, two floating nodes, and then basically, when you increase the voltage, then it will automatically uh, transfer. Uh, some of that step uh, at the output. And then Miller Miller effect will, will come in uh, into play later when you start transitioning and so on. Another question. Uh, how do you pick your ID set? In this case, it, are you using it in velocity saturation, the ID set? Correct. Um, but yeah, how do, how do you know which um, mode of operation to use it? Or do you always, is ID set always uh, indicative of a velocity saturation current? Uh, remember the pocket version of uh, model equations? So basically the slide that shows you uh, uh, family of curves, ID versus VDS for different VGS, and it gives you that unified formula. And then in, in that unified formula, formula, you have that voltage V min. And then you have to compute basically that V min as uh, the minimum of VDS, VDSAT, and VGT. And depending on which uh, of those three values ends up being minimum, that determines your mode of operation. So you, you, you definitely do have to make an assumption. 
and then work with that with that assumption. But from from what we learned in uh, in that model, you basically have in this case in the delay calculation, you normally work with that highest VGS uh, curve. You have VGS is equal to VDD for your transistor, and then uh, you are sure in velocity saturation in that mode and. Uh, especially your VDD is also a uh, VDS is also high. It goes between VDD and VDD over two. So if your VDD over two is greater than your VD set, you are done. So basically, it's velocity saturation. So you, uh, the, uh, to answer your question, it is uh, uh, fair to assume for delay calculation that you're velocity saturated, but don't always assume that. Make sure you understand uh, really the conditions under which uh, you apply uh, that assumption. Okay. So okay, now uh, understanding this formula is uh, uh, really important uh, uh, to be able to derive uh, this model. But now the question is, okay, now I have these equations and I have all these parameters are equivalent. I have all these capacitance, and what does that mean to me as as a designer? Now the question is, what are the parameters that I can really play with to be able to uh, adjust my propagation delay and design for uh, good performance or uh, not so good performance, low power, and so on. So uh, one of the uh, si simple guidelines uh, over here, when you look at the, into this formula, is basically keep the capacitance as low as possible, right? That's that's a good uh, good idea. Uh, then uh, another is uh, to basically increase your um, transistor width because you know that your R equivalent is inversely proportional to the width of your transistor. But then uh, the problem becomes is that uh, all these uh, most of these capacitances that you find in the CL are also sort of geometry kind of capacitances that are related to the size of your uh, device. And then you basically may be hurting yourself uh, if, if you do so. And basically, if you keep increasing, increasing, increasing your uh, width, what you're going to end up with is basically that uh, the diffusion capacitance uh, at the drain side uh, drain and the ground at your output will become the dom dominant capacitance because it's proportional to the W. And then if you basically keep increasing that uh, W, then all these other capacitances will become negligible uh, in uh, the limit case. You basically have your uh, wiring and uh, fan out capacitance negligible. So you have just basically your self-loading uh, capacitance uh, proportional to the W. Now, what does that mean for resistance? It means that the resistance goes as 1 over W. So you mul multiply these two, you basically have a constant delay. You can increase W as much as you want. You're not going to improve your delay. And we'll come to that. So you have to be careful with uh, that. And then another uh, technique over here is basically if you increase uh, your VDD. And uh, we'll come to that later on uh, in the class where you can basically understand uh, for a given operating point, would be would it be better for me to maybe uh, increase my VDD uh, and downsize my gates, or maybe upsize my gates and decrease VDD to sort of kind of trade off the two effects? A question. Uh, on that side, why do you divide the resistances by two? Uh, okay, so uh, the question is, why do you divide resistances by two? Remember uh, uh, the metrics that we introduced. We, we can say these are the real delays that we can measure. TPHL in this case, TPLH over here. But oftentimes, you really want to know the relative uh, speed of your gate by averaging out the two. And uh, you may wonder, does this really make sense? And uh, imagine the situation when you have a chain of identical gates, for example, inverters. You have low to high, and then you have high to low. You have low to high, high to low. And then the question is, how long does it take uh, for a signal to propagate between uh, input uh, to the first gain in the chain to some uh, nth gain uh, uh, in the chain. And then you basically keep adding up this LH and HL. And if you average them out, you kind of get the quality metric of, of your gate. Now, as a designer, uh, let's see uh, what we can do uh, basically to uh, Let's first understand the important contributors uh, to, to this delay. So let's write again uh, this uh, expression. Uh, so this is the uh, three quarters of uh, R. Uh, this is the R equivalent over here, given by this expression, three quarters of VDD over ID set N that we derived uh, a couple slides back. And you have sim simply 0.69 R equivalent CL. So now let's expand this ID set N to understand uh, what is the impact of VDD on your propagation delay. And that's given uh, in this formula. So basically, a couple uh, conclusions from this formula. So you see that the shape of this uh, TP versus VDD curve 
is fairly similar to the shape of your equivalent resistance versus VDD. Right? You had for high VDD, you have low resistance. For low VDD, as you get closer to your uh, threshold voltage, you get high uh, resistance. And that increases your, uh, that's, that's because basically uh, reflected in the propagation delay directly. Increase in resistance, increase in propagation delay. Now, uh, let's assume that your VDD is much greater than VD sat over 2 plus VT. So in that case, uh, this factor uh, cancels out with the DD, VDD on top. So you basically have almost independent uh, propagation delay on uh, VDD. That is just a crude first order approximation. And uh, basically then, um, uh, when you uh, decrease VDD, you will have uh, this increase. And then further increasing VDD will have more or less diminishing return, because uh, you don't have that much of return in your propagation delay for a large investment in uh, VDD. That's basically flattening out uh, on this case. So it's kind of reasonable to work in this uh, trade-off regime and then understand which way you need to go by uh, tuning each of the parameters. Now, finally, from the designer's perspective, uh, you are normally uh, going to play with uh, the geometry of your device, with your W and L. Uh, make sure that um, mostly W, L will be uh, minimum uh, length. And then you will have to make a decision, so, okay, now I have to size this gate for certain performance or certain power. And then I have this basically parameter W. So now it's important to understand the impact of this designer uh, parameter W on uh, your uh, propagation delay. So this basically assumes that we start with some nominal circuit that has a certain propagation delay. And then we keep increasing uh, the size, the W of that uh, gate. What's going to happen in that case is basically that you are going to end up with uh, uh, increasing the W will increase your diffusion capacitance. So maybe you can do that on the overhead over here, just to make. Can you switch? Thank you. Uh, so you basically have your driving gate, you have PMOS, your NMOS. And then you have the capacitance intrinsic to this gate. Then you have another component, wire capacitance. And then you finally have uh, gate, fan out gate at the output that has its own input capacitance. So it's input capacitance to that gate. Now, your total load capacitance is equal to the intrinsic capacitance plus wire capacitance plus input capacitance of uh, this gate. Now, if you keep scaling the size of this gate by a factor of S times W, then what you're going to end up with is that basically your intrinsic capacitance was proportional this capacitance was proportional to your W, so you will have basically uh, now S times this intrinsic capacitance. And as you keep increasing this S, basically these two will diminish because this one will, will become dominant. So your CL eventually becomes dominated by your intrinsic capacitance. But at the same time, you have your equivalent resistance that is proportional to basically your equivalent resistance at of your nominal device 0 divided by that test. So you multiply this together, you basically have uh, self-loading. So flattening of the delay in that case is called the self-loading uh, effect. Okay, so switching back to slides. And that's uh, shown over here. Now the question is, uh, if I have my pull up and pull down uh, PMOS and NMOS, uh, the question is, at which uh, W P over W N I have equal propagation delay number one, and number two, uh, which ratio minimizes the propagation delay taken as average of the two? And that's investigated over here in uh, uh, this slide. So you basically have that uh, your um, 
propagation delay over here as a function of this beta factor, where beta is the ratio of Wp over Wn. So you can see if you, for example, increase your beta, then um, so you have basically, uh, let me first explain this. So you, ha you have a trade-off here. So if you increase your uh, PMOS uh, width, that will improve uh, your low to high transition, right? So your LH will uh, go down. But increasing PMOS width will also present more loading capacitance for the pull-down. So you basically are hurting your other transition. So when you have a trade-off uh, like that, basically the solution has to be somewhere in the middle. And um, so that, that's illustrated in, in this slide. So basically for um, PMOS to NMOS ratio that we found to yield a symmetrical voltage transfer characteristic and VM at uh, VDD over 2, uh, that's basically uh, no longer uh, to be uh, the good uh, uh, size of PMOS uh, for uh, the performance analysis. So you basically uh, will end up with a surprising result that that ratio of 3 is now going to end up being about 1.9 for uh, delay minimization and that is uh, for all because of all the effects that we discussed so far. So you, you basically have uh, by reducing your uh, device you reduce your capacitance and you have to uh, consider uh, other effects such as resist resistance, load capacitance, and so on uh, into your analysis. And um, equal delay uh, between lo uh, rising and falling transitions is now about uh, 2.4. And that's basically the ratio of P and N that has equal uh, equivalent uh, resistance. Now uh, let's understand uh, this in concept of uh, in the context of uh, environment. So you basically have that the load of uh, okay sure. So the load is equal to uh, drain of your PMOS in the first stage, drain capacitance of your NMOS in the first stage. So that's the intrinsic uh, capacitance. Uh, then you have uh, your uh, wire capacitance, and then you finally have your uh, load capacitance from the gate. So you have PMOS stage number two, and then you have NMOS stage number two. Now let's assume that from the nominal case uh, we have uh, WP over WN uh, ratio. and. So you know that all these capacitances are basically geometry capacitances. So unit capacitances, capacitances per unit area for both PMOS and NMOS are equal, right? So if you scale the ratio of P to N by beta, you are scaling the capacitance by beta as well. So you basically have now CDP is approximately beta times uh, CDN, and you also have CGP is approximately beta times CGN. So therefore, you have that your equivalent load capacitance is equal to 1 plus beta times CDN plus, that's the first stage, intrinsic stuff, plus the CGN load stuff, plus wire capacitance. Now, for the propagation delay analysis, you have to uh, assume also uh, equivalent resistances and for the same uh, device geometry equivalent resistances are not equal because of the different drive strength. So you have basically that your R equi equivalent N plus R equivalent P divided by beta because if you make P wider then uh, its equivalent resistance drops with this ratio. And then we can uh, write this as R equivalent N 1 plus this ratio of uh, unit sized NMOS to PMOS resistances divided by beta. And then you, when you take the propagation delay equation and then say TP is equal 0.69 uh, times uh, R equivalent R equivalent times CL when this R equivalent is the average this average uh, over here uh, then you get basically differentiate that with respect to beta equate to zero and then you end up with this parameter beta is equal to square root 
R times 1 plus CW CDN 1 plus CGN 2 So what this tells you basically for uh, negligible wire capacitance, if the wire capacitance is zero, you end up with just this square root of uh, uh, the ratio of resistances in uh, both uh, NMOS and PMOS being uh, unit size. And then if you uh, have large wire capacitance, then you have to increase this factor beta. So basically uh, your delay is minimized at different points depending on your environment you have whether you have pronounced impact of wire capacitance or not so in uh, your calculations you really need to understand that and make sure that you take all the important contributors into your model and be able to make right decisions okay question mm -hmm. so we do not consider the Miller capacitances in here uh, uh, the question is, do we consider Miller capacitances? Uh, we do, but we just assume basically that Miller capacitances are uh, included in this model. So let's say this is a, a drain capacitance of the PMOS lumped together. So it's basically diffusion plus the Miller effect and so on. But they're both, they both geometry type of capacitances. So we can just basically say this is the capacitance per unit area and multiplied by this geometry factor. So now going further with the environment, so far the analysis that we presented uh, for propagation delay assumed ideal step at the input. But in reality that's not the case because if you look into your uh, environment in which your circuit operates, then you realize that uh, your input is driven by the output of other gate. And that uh, other gate has some finite rise and fall time and so on. So then we have to refine our uh, delay model. So you basically assume that your gate uh, is uh, driven uh, with a certain uh, rise time that is now uh, non-zero, and then you devise this simple model. So you have propagation delay is equal to the step response delay that we uh, just derived in a few slides back. Plus, uh, there is also some fraction of the rise time that is uh, also uh, now becoming to uh, play into your equation. So it's basically the rise time of your input also uh, affects your delay. The longer the rise time, the longer the delay. So you basically take um, a fraction of the step response of the previous gate uh, into your equation and uh, multiply by this uh, parameter eta. And this parameter is an uh, empirical parameter and you basically can uh, calibrate your uh, gates in SPICE and then figure out uh, what is approximate value of this parameter assuming that you calculate first step response of uh, the driver gate then you uh, calculate uh, the step response of your gate and then uh, you, uh, you assume some loaded output and then you figure out basically by how much you need to multiply uh, the delay of the previous gate uh, to a step response uh, to be able to fit uh, the delay of uh, your gate uh, correctly. And this uh, factor is about uh, uh, 0.25 or so, just to give you a rough idea. That's the correction factor that you have to have uh, in mind. And so much for propagation delay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first lectures we talked about, like an inverter chain being a way to measure delay, but it wasn't very accurate. So, like this complete model measuring the delay, is this an accurate number on the delay? Or? Uh, so that's a great question. So uh, none of these models is really accurate. It's basically uh, more or less uh, a, a simplification of. Uh, very uh, various uh, second order effects that are going on and then basically you can uh, come up with some uh, th the goal here is to sort of understand the effects uh, that are causing uh, delay to change and uh, derive simple enough engineering models that are suitable for hand analysis. So as you see basically we are sort of abstracting away from that uh, complicated model that we uh, derived uh, in uh, lecture on uh, MOS models and that model was even like a really vast simplification of all the effects that are going on that are included in SPICE. So we say well 
uh, let's take this uh, current equation and we are, we are happy with, with it because it matches your uh, uh, cur uh, voltage uh, current characteristics reasonably well in the regions of interest and then based on that model we will derive some other parameters for delay and now we are sort of kind of abstracting things away, b uh, things are becoming simpler and simpler and you're going to like this in the probably next uh, lecture or next week we will uh, do uh, logical effort analysis where you basically forget all of this and basically just say if I know that the delay of my inverter uh, is this much. If I co construct more complicated gates, delay of an end is going to be four-thirds of the delay of an inverter. I don't care what's going on with this inverter. I can calibrate that in SPICE, but it's basically uh, just sort of uh, understand uh, what's going on and, and so on. But you can't really hope to uh, start from the device physics and have good, accurate uh, model that encapsulates everything. That's what SPICE does. Calibration means, uh, I mean by basically, you just uh, simulate uh, your circuit in SPICE and figure out what's the number for fan out for inverter delay. And related to this previous slide, just one uh, comment. If you have to design, for example, for the worst case delay of your gate, uh, then which point would you pick? The minimum delay or some other point? D equal, th th that's right. Okay. Okay, now very important uh, metric, quality metric power dissipation. So let's try to understand uh, where does power go in uh, CMOS circuits. So we'll identify a couple major uh, contributors to power consumption in uh, CMOS circuits. Uh, most dominant component, still most dominant, is dynamic power consumption that is related to charging and discharging uh, your gate capacitances. Then we will have uh, short cur circuit uh, currents that uh, exist uh, between supply rails during switching that are not going into uh, the capacitances, they're not doing anything useful. And we will do also analysis of uh, leakage currents and also later on another component that's not listed here that occurs in some circuits like memory, sense amps, that would be uh, basically your static current. It's uh, due to bias conditions on uh, your gates. So uh, contributor, most important contributor over here, power dissipation. L so let's assume uh, discharge and charge cycle on uh, your inverter. So when you charge up your capacitance, we derive that the energy taken from the source, in this case VDD, is equal to CL times VDD squared. The amount of energy spent in charging the capacitance was half of that, CL VDD squared divided by two. And then the other half got dissipated on as a heat on this PMOS. And then you notice basically that th that amount of heat dissipation wasn't proportional to the size of your transistor, W. And then uh, this amount of uh, energy, CL VDD squared, over two is stored in the capacitance for the discharge cycle. Now, when you have the discharge cycle, basically your NMOS turns on and burns all that energy into heat. And basically, uh, the energy is dissipated from the power source again when you have a rising transition. So basically, uh, the power consumption is related to the speed of uh, burning this energy into your uh, capacitances, burning this useful energy. So you basically have to uh, multiply energy per transition by the frequency at which uh, these energy consuming transitions occur. And that's how you define your uh, dynamic power consumption. Now this uh, frequency is kind of uh, interesting, uh, important factor to understand. It is normally related to the clock frequency, but the frequency of zero to one transitions is, occurs much uh, less frequent uh, than the clock ticks. Uh, before we go into that, uh, just one uh, sort of side note here. Uh, this is uh, uh, a modification for uh, energy consumption for circuits that have uh, reduced swing. So let's assume that you have your NMOS over here configured as a pass gate. You have your VDD uh, connected to its drain and then you have uh, VDD also at the gate. So if you undergo rising transition at the gate, uh, this transistor will turn off when your source becomes VDD minus VT. 
So you basically have a reduced swing over here. And as a result, you basically have uh, less energy consumed uh, to charge this capacitance because your voltage level is no longer uh, full swing. Uh, this obviously uh, results in uh, performance uh, penalty, but this is still uh, a technique uh, that is commonly used, for example, uh, for bit line uh, swing in memory when you have sense amps that detect very small uh, swing uh, differentially and then uh, amplify uh, the signal, and in that way you can uh, reduce power uh, consumption. And now this is a uh, purely academic exercise uh, over here, but it's kind of interesting uh, to understand uh, the effects of uh, charging a capacitor and uh, where does the energy go. So let's uh, first uh, go, go to the overhead over here. Assume that we have uh, basically an RC network. So we have load and then we have R and then we have voltage over here, voltage source. And then we assume that we have a step input. So what we derive in this case is basically that the energy stored on the capacitance EC is equal to one half CL times V VDD squared. If this goes between zero and VDD, and this was when uh, you apply step input. So now the, uh, what was going on here is basically when you apply a step input, the initial condition on this capacitance was zero voltage. And you cannot instantaneously change voltage on a capacitor, right? Then this voltage became VDD, and then you have this large current that gets dissipated into heat over here. Now let's assume that we have no, no longer have this step voltage at the input, but let's assume rather really gradual uh, increase in your input voltage and see what's going to happen in this case. So let's assume that we have a really slow input that goes through this resistance and this capacitance. And let's calculate what uh, energy going to be uh, delivered on to this capacitance and how much energy is going to be wasted on uh, the resistance. So now if you look at this uh, RC network, uh, uh, what would be the frequency response of this guy? What does it do? If this is your attenuation and this is your frequency, what, what's this? That's a low pass filter, right? So now if you have a really slow signal that's sitting somewhere around these frequencies, then you basically have a nice situation where your voltage increases gradually and you, have, you can maintain almost zero current through this uh, resistor. Because you have, over here, you basically have almost uh, no attenuation and uh, through your network. But what's going uh, to happen over here is uh, we can basically now assume um, that we have some current. <coughs> I of T that is charging uh, this, uh, delivering energy to this RC network. And then basically this voltage on a capacitor VC is equal to average of that current times the period of interest. So now we can calculate this average current based on this expression and energy that is dissipated into a resistor as a heat, so ER is equal to basically integrate R times 0 to T I squared of T dt, and uh, that is greater than equal to R integrate 0 to T I average square dt, and then, in, then you plug in this I average, and then you end up with ER is equal to RC divided by T C V D D squared. So now compare these two expressions. So basically we have also ER, that's the heat dissipation over here, CL V D D squared. So what does this tell you? 
So basically what, what this tells you is if you have long enough period of time compared to your RC time constant such that your T is greater than 2RC, then you win in this case. Now if you make T infinitely long, basically you have zero energy wasted on your resistor. And it's summarized uh, here in the slide, if you go back to slides. Uh, so basically you have, uh, in uh, our standard model, you have voltage source, you have exponential decaying current that results in uh, this much energy uh, dissipated as a heat. And if you have linear ramp on voltage and charge your capacitance with a constant current, then you have this expression, which gives you better energy than uh, for, for the case when T is uh, greater than RC. And adiabatic circuits, this is called basically adiabatic charging. You remember uh, your thermodynamics class where you have Carnot cycle and that adi adiabatic curve that's related to exchange of uh, energy in various cycles. So that's basically a term borrowed from thermodynamics over here, but uh, this is really uh, uh, difficult to implement in uh, practice because it's uh, not really uh, interesting to have infinite slopes at the uh, at the input of your gates because infinite slopes mean really bad performance and uh, but it's interesting example so now back to uh, real life we have uh, basically uh, analysis of uh, dynamic power consumption and then we introduce this uh, concept of uh, switching uh, frequency where you have your 0 to 1 uh, <laughs> transitions occurring. So you have basically consider that you have a CMOS gate for n clock cycles. So basically analyze it over a period of time and count the number of cycles n. And then, then uh, uh, what you need to do is basically uh, count the number of 0 to 1 transitions that occur uh, in that uh, same time period. And that small number n is basically the number of 0 to 1 transitions in n clock cycles. So you, you, you take basically your average power as the limit of uh, the clock frequency divided uh, en over n times the clock frequency, which basically gives you this parameter n over n divided by n. So this is your switching activity. So if you have, for example, eight clock cycles and you have two zero to one switching transitions, then your switching activity in that case is basically 0 0.25, two divided by eight. And uh, this gives you a nice expression that you can uh, express your power consumption in terms of your clock frequency. Uh, total load capacitance and uh, supply voltage and also this uh, switching activity. This is a really important factor the, and this, what's makes, uh, this is what makes uh, power estimation really difficult because uh, in a large scale system you have very complex functionality dependencies uh, between um, logic levels and so on and then it is very hard to estimate uh, the total average switching activity across the full chip. Uh, because it is also input data dependent uh, and uh, so on. And this is a parameter that you really need to understand. It's one of the very important uh, uh, concepts in uh, digital circuits, this uh, switching activity, alpha uh, 0 to 1. And what you can see here is basically that the uh, power is dominantly uh, determined by the supply voltage. Uh, then you have switching capacitance, switched capacitance, uh, clock frequency, and this uh, switching activity. So now, second uh, component for power is basically this short circuit currents. And this is another reason uh, you will see why uh, adiabatic charging is not so compelling. Uh, so now let's assume that we have basically gate operating in real environment, and then we have uh, certain slope at the input. And then we have output loaded with some uh, capacitance. Now, as we saw in the previous uh, discussion, uh, most of uh, the useful energy, all the useful energy is basically stored in this capacitance. But during transient regime, 
you have this additional short circuit current that exists between VDD and ground that does not go into uh, this capacitance. So it's pure waste, totally wasted power. And um, what happens here is that due to finite slope, as you go from VDD to zero, if this is your VT for the PMOS, this is your VT for the NMOS, so you basically have this region region of operation where your both PMOS and NMOS are on. And then you have current. And this is quite a bit of current because in this case, basically at the peak, uh, you have both your devices in saturation. So it's a lot of current. You want to make sure that you don't spend too much time traveling through this region. Now, uh, you got this? Copy down? Okay. So go to the quiz question for you. So now let's assume that we have a gate. And then we have certain slope at the input. And now I have load capacitance. So now the question is, for which value of load capacitance you will have more short circuit current? Large CL or small uh, CL? So let's analyze two extreme cases. So CL goes to infinity, CL equal to zero. And we look into this current, having in mind that you have certain slope at the input. Now, who thinks that you have more short circuit current for CL is equal to infinite? Anybody? One? How about CL equals zero? One, two, three, four, five, six. So one for infinity, six for zero, and the rest of the class don't mat uh, thinks it doesn't matter. It's either zero or 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 uh, infinite. So now, uh, uh, basically, uh, the correct answer here is you have to think about uh, what this means in terms of slopes. So basically, uh, the correct answer over here is uh, that you have. Let's see, the case is when you have zero, so you have more more short circuit current. Simply because if you have uh, infinite CL, then uh, that means that the slope of this transition will also be infinite, right? And then uh, both your transistors uh, will, uh, relatively speaking, spend uh, very little time uh, in this region compa compared to uh, this output slope because uh, in this case if uh, you have basically uh, infinite slope uh, at the output then your output V out will be at the fixed uh, voltage level so it will be at uh, zero in this case and therefore you will not have uh, in a lot of uh, short, short circuit current and let's go back to uh, slides now so that's basically shown over here. If you keep uh, increasing your load capacitance, so that basically the relative ratio of your rise and fall times to the input and output changes. And if you increase your load capacitance, then basically the impact of the input slope uh, becomes negligible. And if you keep your uh, load capacitance zero, then your short circuit current increases. Now, uh, this is uh, another graph uh, that shows the same effect, basically. It plots power, short circuit power, total power dissipation, in this case, versus the load capacitance. And uh, you would ideally want to have a straight line between CL and your power. Basically, what that means is that you have all your power going into useful charging operation of, uh, for your uh, charging and discharging of your gate capacitances. And then what you have over here is a family of curves of total power consumption for different rise times say the input. So you see if you increase rise time going from uh, the bottom to top, then you have basically more short circuit current and therefore more uh, power is contributed to short circuit. Now, the other effect over here is that if you have uh, low CL, 
then your slope really becomes to matter. And then your power is uh, dominated by your short circuit. And it is uh, flattening out in this case. If you go toward uh, higher CL, basically your sh impact of short circuit uh, is not so pronounced. And then you basically end up going back along the straight line where your uh, switching uh, component is dominant. So you, you basically uh, can see, obviously, that there is a trade-off as well here. And then the good rule uh, for designer, from the design perspective, that is that you keep your uh, input and output slopes equal. That minimizes your short circuit power consumption. Uh, so basically, when you have two opposing uh, constraints, one going in one direction, the other one pulling in another direction, it's a good assumption to start uh, assuming that they're equal. That's probably the optimal balance. And then you work from that assumption. <coughs> now, we'll finish this next time. But now I'm going to quickly jump to a slide that is important for your homework number three, the model that you need to use for problem number four. That is going to be given right here. So basically, you use this expression. You have sub-threshold conduction as a function of VGS, VDS. And these are the parameters that you need in your homework. You have uh, this uh, parameter 1.5, and KT on Q is 26 millivolts. Make sure you use this. And then uh, next class, we will wrap up with power and go into uh, buffer chain sizing optimization.
Did you, did you find this analogy? No, wait, 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 you have the homework on you. Yeah. Hold up. Okay. So, this is ideal square wave in for a small delay. Obviously, when you can have this thing. Yeah, but you're looking for transition wave. Wait, wait, my picture is like this. You have two of them connected. So, this. No, 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 ideal square input. Which means you're driven with a step. So, input is. Then, uh, it's, it's a perfect step. So you put zero one. Zero one. one. Yes. Yes. Uh, but that's so not realistic. I mean, they use us. Why? Right. Well, I thought so we were looking for the behavior of this guy, like when it's connected.